My name is Bob Rowan. I became a nuclear control technician at the Humboldt Bay Nuclear Power Plant in Eureka. Uh, the plant went online in 1963, in August of 63, and I showed up in March of 1964. My first job at the plant was apprentice to instrument repairman, but within six months, I entered the uh, nuclear control technician training program. And after serving the longest journeyman uh, program in the PG&E system, I became a nuclear control technician. I thought that I had found a, a career of a lifetime when I got out of the Marines and went to work there and thought I was on the ground floor of a program that uh, in an industry that was going to be second to none. But as I got into it, I found that uh, it was not what it was all cracked up to be. How long was the training program? And what, what it involved? 42 months. Mm -hmm. And it was a very uh, rigorous training program that uh, required a lot of uh, hours uh, on the weekends and at night, learning all the things that we had to learn, as well as uh, classroom work in the, uh, during the day. Um, oh. And so what happened? You started working there? And, uh... Well, I, I, I became involved in, uh, uh, and developed a special interest in radiation protection. The nuclear control technician program in those days consisted of actually three elements, nuclear instrumentation, uh, radiation protection, and radiochemistry. But I was particularly concerned about the uh, radiation protection aspect of the, of the job. And, and uh, I, so when I started studying all of the uh, training materials that pg e had provided, I found that they were not in agreement with what I had learned in the military. Uh, I was a Marine Pathfinder, and I trained in uh, ABC uh, warfare, atomic, biological, and chemical warfare. And the, the uh, atomic uh, part of that uh, talked about the kinds of uh, hazards associated with radiation that did not agree one bit with what pg e was providing us. So I started asking some embarrassing questions. It, at first, they weren't necessarily uh, challenging uh, plant management, but, but their responses led me to a confrontation with plant management because I felt that I was being lied to. And, um, Were you shocked that they would lie to you, or did anyone tell you? Well, at, at, at one point, yes, because I believed in corporate America, and, and I believed in the government. I thought the AEC would do everything that uh, they were charged with uh, in terms of their responsibilities of protecting employees and the general public, but it turns out that that wasn't the case at all. So you began asking questions, and what, what happened? Uh, well, uh, eventually I was uh, told that it, uh, that if I was looking for trouble, I was going to find it. The plan engineer made that very clear to me. And, uh, and I told him uh, my response was, I'm not going to be bullied. Uh, I, I still had a lot of Marine in me uh, in my mid-20s. And, 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 I, and I just said, I'm not going to kowtow to you. I won't do that. Eventually, I, I found myself faced with having to, uh, well, for example, I was ordered to sign false shipping documents, the spent fuel shipping cask, and there's a long story, it's in my book. It, it, it spells out exactly what took place. But the shipping cask ended up with spherical contaminations exceeding DOT regs, and, and uh, the, the, the release papers that had my name pre-typed on it as a nuclear control technician, and, and I said, I'm not signing those papers because they're false. And, uh, and I was ordered to do it, so I signed them under protest, and then I put it in the radiation control log, exactly what had taken place, and uh, I had another uh, serious set to with the plant engineer. And, um, and, and that's just one example of many things that happened. For example, I was doing a C area survey, C standing for clean, so we were doing routine uh, surveys weekly in the non-controlled areas of the plant, just to make sure that no uh, contaminated materials, equipment uh, had, had uh, left the control area of the plant. And as I was passing through the cold machine shop, I found a, a contaminated uh, section of pipe that was about 14 to 16 inches in diameter and about 23, 24 inches long. 
and uh, and I had no idea how that how that uh, piece of pipe got there, and uh, there was no one in the cold machine shop at the time I made that survey, but I ended up. Uh, finding a welder that was behind a welding curtain on the end of the machine shop. And I said, do you have any idea how that piece of pipe uh, ended up on that workbench? And he said, yeah, I put it there. And I said, well, did you know that it was radioactively contaminated? And he said, no, I had no idea. And I said, well, where did you get that? Out of the scrap metal bin. So then uh, I ran out to the scrap metal bin and it was completely empty. And I came back to the welder and I said, look, the scrap metal bin was empty. He says, well, there were several sections of pipe, just like the one I have on the end of the bench. And it was out there when I picked it up. He says, well, how long ago was that? He says, well, it was a couple of days ago. And I said, oh. And so I went to the uh, uh, maintenance foreman who's responsible for things like that. And uh, he said, what happened to all the stuff that was in the scrap metal bin? And he says, well, GNI scrap metals uh, came and picked it up. And I says, did you know that uh, the welder pulled a piece of pipe out of there that was contaminated? And he said, uh, no, I, I didn't know that. And I says, well, was that stuff, well, I, eventually I learned that it was part of the suppression chamber pipe that was cut up in sections so they could pull it out of the suppression chamber. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and so uh, that was the only way they could remove that pipe. And so I said, well, was there an unconditional release tag on it? No. I said, if it came out of the control unit, it had to have an unconditional release tag in order to be released. You never saw it? No. Did you see any paperwork on it? No. And I said, well, did you call GNR Scrap Metal to pick up that pipe? He said, uh, no, the front office did that. And so it turns out that what really happened was they had some contaminated pipe, very heavy, very difficult to dispose of, very expensive if it's radioactively contaminated. And so they just, somebody in the middle of the night took that stuff out to the scrap metal bin and then called GNR scrap metal and have them come pick it up. And who would be the wiser? No one figured that the welder was going to pick up one of those pieces to put on the workbench. He was going to make something out of it. And, uh, and so I, uh, I got into a lot of hot water because I dug my heels in saying that we should have uh, uh, some control technicians go down and retrieve all that stuff, bring it back to the plant, and dispose of it properly. pg e refused to do it. Um, yeah, how dangerous was this? Well, it, it, it's not something that, it wasn't lethal. It was just radioactively contaminated. And, and our radiation control standards said things could only be released from the uh, controlled areas of the unit, of the, uh, of unit three, which is the nuclear unit, if the counts uh, are less than 100 counts per minute above background. And the, what I found was uh, approximately th three to 400 counts per minute above background. And is there a lot of radioactive, heavily radioactive piping in, the, in this facility? Well, sure. It came out of the it came out of the uh, suppression chamber, right alongside of the reactor, and uh, it was it was contaminated. Um, the the uh, and so I I felt that we should go down to GNR scrap metal, retrieve the stuff for that portion of the pipe that was maybe clean, then send it back to GNR. If it's not, then dispose of it properly. And, and uh, it was determined at my unemployment insurance appeals board hearing that uh, when the referee asked him, uh, the radiation protection engineer that I put on the stand as my witness, uh, he said, the, the uh, referee said, well, if that had been determined to be 300 counts per minute before leaving the controlled area, it wouldn't have left the controlled area, would it? And he, he said, oh, no, no, sir, it would have stayed in the controlled area. So it was, uh, it was inconsistent. The thing of it is, that pipe could have been more, I mean, the other pieces of the, of the suppression chamber pipe that could have been contaminated uh, more than this one, and possibly less, it's hard to say. But it was a continuous run of pipe, and this one section was contaminated. It was reasonable to assume that the other sections probably contaminated as well. So you were retaliated for bringing this to the attention of the PG? Oh, yes, yes, for, very much so. Uh, eventually, and, and, and that's just one, one thing that happened. 
the, the spent fuel uh, shipping cask was another. Let me sh share with you one other incident that happened. Uh, I uh, was uh, asked to go out to the clean side of the railroad gate to survey out some painting equipment. And the painting equipment, uh, the GC painters, general construction painters were wanting to, you know, have their uh, equipment surveyed out so that they could use it in other places in the, in the, in the power plant. And, um, and the, the radiation protection, uh, the, the uh, radiation protection control technician on the, on the controlled side of the gate was having trouble with his GM. And so uh, there was some question about maybe it was not completely surveyed out like it should have been. So uh, that's what I was out there for on the clean side. I had my own GM on the clean side, background was lower, and uh, I could verify whether the, the equipment was uh, okay or not. Turns out that the equipment was fine. But in the process, one of the GC painters, and there were three of them standing there, waiting to receive the equipment and take it on to other areas of the plant, stepped over closer to where I was at to see what I was doing, and my GM all of a sudden went crazy. And it, long story short, the painter was contaminated. Your GM is what? It's a it's a, like a Geiger counter. So the Geiger it, counter, yeah. a dosimeter? Or? It, 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 it's a radiation uh, counter. counter. It was contaminated, but it turns out the other two were contaminated as well. I said, hey, fellas, when were you last in the control area? It was four days previous to that. Four days. I said, you left the control area in this condition, and you've been out and about home and wherever you've traveled for four days? And they said, well, yeah, but we didn't know it. But it turns out that they didn't properly survey themselves out uh, four days earlier. And so I immediately had them go across the gate and to the decon showers, and they had all their clothes confiscated, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had to be scrubbed down thoroughly and mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, I then made the recommendation that we uh, go to their homes in the places that they had frequented to, to make sure that they didn't take any contamination wherever, and uh, pg and &E refused to do it. And I insisted upon it, and another example of, of them and management and Bob Rowan getting crossways. And so, uh, now you ask what happened to, uh, uh, they, they eventually decided they needed to get rid of me. And there was another control technician by the name of Forrest Williams. Uh, and and uh, I, Were I, you I, surprised that they would try to fire you for basically protecting the health and safety of yourself and the, and the Well, uh, yeah, at the time I was because I, uh, although I've learned a lot since, and my answer to that question now would be no, but, but at the time, yes, I, 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 I was surprised that, that plant management would respond the way that they did. You see, what happened was it, it was small things at first, and, and they just build and build and build to much larger things. And then, of course, I started bowing my neck big time. And my book spells all this out much clearer than I'm telling it right now. We got to the point where, well, let's provide another example before I get into the company safety meetings. We had uh, RWPs routine work permits, we called them radiation work permits, that provided the requirements for every job we were doing in the plant that that, that, that work permit mm -hmm. uh, addressed. And so we were doing reactor water sample analysis, collecting the reactor, reactor water samples and then taking them to the radiochemistry lab and then uh, analyzing those samples. And, and those RWPs provided for a, a, a dose rate to the control technicians doing the work of 5 to 50 milligrams per hour. A maximum of 50, but more closer to 5. And that, the RWP was written prior to the startup of the nuclear unit in August of 1963. Well, when the fuel cladding in the reactor broke down, the initial loading of the fuel cladding was stainless steel, not zircaloy, uh, that the Navy had developed. It was a far superior but much more expensive cladding and the plant became grossly contaminated and received the, uh, the reputation of, of being the dirtiest atomic plant in the nation. And, and uh, we were living with that. And so back to the reactor water samples, those samples consisting of 5 to 50 millirankins per hour 
goes, went clear up to 3,000 MR per hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I started squawking uh, about that. I told management, we need to do something. We need to be protected from, from those real hot samples that were not only collecting but analyzing in and, and my hands. You can see what happened to my hands. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, I, I don't know to the extent that the, that, that, that the radiation uh, caused that, but, but it more likely it did. And, and so what happened uh, was that I, I got fed up with that because I couldn't get plant management, I couldn't get an engineer who was above both of them to do anything about it. I said, we need to have a biological shield constructed in front of the reactor water sampling station, the collection point, uh, to protect workers uh, when they're collecting the samples. And then we needed to have a way to transport those very hot samples to the radiochemistry lab. And they just wouldn't do it because it, was, it, it required the company to spend money. And so it, it just didn't happen until the December 12, 1967 safety meeting when I stood up and very publicly demanded that something be done. And I not only addressed the, the, uh, the collection and analysis of reactor water samples, but I also addressed the, the same type of problem with the collection of off-gas samples. And, um, and after that meeting, I was called, well, we all called into the uh, conference room and told that we were not to use the company safety meeting in this way and that we were supposed to resolve all these issues with our first line supervisors first. And I explained to my uh, plan engineer, I said, look, I've already, I, I, I did that for months and it didn't result in anything. And so it, more bad stuff went into my personnel file and, and I was threatened by him. How did they threaten uh, you? Uh, well, he said, you know, you're, you're, if you're looking for trouble, you're going to find it. He was dumb enough to make that statement uh, under oath at my unemployment here in the appeals board hearing. And so I've got that in my book. It's all spelled out so right they, there. They, admitted it. Admitted they, they did, yeah. And they, they admitted lots of things there. Here's the reason for that. When I filed for my, for my unemployment insurance after I was fired, the company said, no, he was fired with cause. And what was the cause that you were fired? They, they said I threatened my supervisor. I, they, made a phone call. I did call my supervisor, but there's another piece to that story. But I did call him, but I didn't threaten him like they said he, they did. Uh, the unemployment hearing, a lot of information came out that uh, yes. where the company admitted that they had actually retaliated against you. Yes. And, and you might ask, well, why would they have candidly stated the kinds of things that I'm referring to? It's because when I walked into the Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board hearing, I put a large briefcase on the table in front of me. They did not know, because I pulled a couple of things out of it, and they, said, Whoa, and they didn't know what else I was going to pull out. So then they didn't want to be embarrassed. Those people had huge egos. And so they didn't want to be embarrassed by saying one thing that was untrue and then me proving them wrong. So even though sometimes they skirted the issues a bit, I kept after it. And then after I kept after it and get them to respond more truthfully, the referee took over and did the same thing. I might say at this point, I prevailed at my unemployment insurance appeals board. I got, I mean, I, I, it was just a matter of uh, unemployment insurance, but I, but I did get it. And the referee said I was fired for reasons other than misconduct. Now, also, did you, did you file a grievance with the union? Or what union were you in? Yeah, I was in the IBEW Local 1245. And yes, we did. And it went to arbitration. I'm still a union man. I'll be a union man for the rest of my life. My dad was uh, a union man. Uh, I understand why unions uh, were necessary. Uh, yeah, I understand, I, I'm fairly knowledgeable of the growth of the American labor, uh, American labor movement during the latter part of the Gilded Age and on into the 20th century. Uh, but I'm very unhappy with what the IBEW did. What did they do? Uh, well, or not do? What they, what, the, what they did not do is uh, <clears throat> they didn't get to the bottom of what happened and why. I was fired because I was a troublemaker at uh, PG&E's nuclear power plant, and and uh, and I, I personally believe that the IBEW Local 1245 was in bed with PG&E. I truly believe that. We went to our uh, arbitration. Forrest Williams 
case went first. He was the other control technician that was fired a week before I was for making statements and asking questions, embarrassing questions. So there were a number of people that, fired. It wasn't just you. Well, just the two of us. The two of yeah. Them, yeah. But, but uh, there, were, there were only seven control technicians at the plant. And four of, our, of the seven were named in a, a totally false police report. And we were never supposed to see that police report. They accused us of some, accused us of some awful things. Who did? Eugenie. What did they accuse you of? Being a subversive, involved in a plot to blow up the power plant. Uh, the, Serious charges. Uh, no, they, they, they said that I was a confirmed cop hater. Of course, there's another piece to that story, but, but nothing could have, could, it was totally ridiculous that they said those things about me. I mean, I was a Marine Pathfinder and Force Reconnaissance, and, and, and uh, I, I just, honor and duty and all those kinds of things were very important to me, and being truthful was absolutely important to me, and obeying the law was important to me. And, and I found out about this police report from a law enforcement officer in the Humboldt County Sheriff's Department who knew me, and he saw that come across his desk. He says, I can't believe what they've done to you, Bob. You better read this, and he showed it to me, and I read it several times, and then he took it back and burned it up in a metal waste paper basket so, because he'd gone too far. He said, if, I think, if, if, if my superiors find out that I... He would be in trouble. Not, oh, yeah, big time. He would. Yeah. They were trying to frame you up, basically. Oh, absolutely. But see, I was never supposed to see that police report. What they did, uh, they sent a copy of it to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And, the, and, and then in that way, I could never get another security clearance to work in that nuclear sensitive environment. I just couldn't, uh, they were blacklisting me is what they were doing and did, did the same thing to Forrest Williams. And there were two other control technicians named in that police report, uh, although they were not fired. And one of them, Raymond Skidmore, was asked by a reporter in, in Eureka why he wasn't fired. And uh, he said because he felt that uh, we had learned our lessons because of the way they treated Bob Rowan and Forrest Williams and that they got rid of the two biggest troublemakers. And so uh, he, he remained very critical. He, he's, he's passed away now. He died of pancreatic cancer. And, um, and he had a, a, apparently a, a pretty big stroke. I've had two strokes myself. And, uh, and, I, and I tell you, this is difficult for me. I get a little bit emotional about this, but we were sent down underneath the reactor to flush NCORs. NCORs are instrumentation that goes up into the reactor from the bottom. And, um, and every now and then, I mean, every so often, they had to be routinely pulled out. And when we got up underneath there, now we're talking dose rate fields of anywhere from 12 to 20, 25 Rankins per hour. That's very high. We could only be in there in a matter of minutes. But while we were flushing in cores, we would get reactor water and reactor crud would rain down on us. And Skidmore probably got the worst of it, uh, the, especially in the, the April, uh, March, April refueling outage of 1970. He went to lunch contaminated. And, and, and it was discovered after, after he came back from lunch that he was contaminated. I've got documentation from PG&E uh, memoranda on that. Uh, so the union, the, the, you went to them and you told them, look, there's serious health and safety tried problems. Tried to. I tried to. What, what, what did they say? I mean, how did you process that? I mean, it's well, the, the uh, IBEW Local 1245 in those days had, I think, about 16 to 18,000 members. Only seven of them were nuclear control techs. But PG&E had this attitude of go nuclear. They were really intending to go nuclear. They were looking at building a nuclear power plant at Bodega Bay, which the Sierra Club defeated. They were looking to build a power plant at Point Arena, and the Sierra Club defeated that one as well. And there were, there were several other that nuclear power plants on the drawing board that never that were never built. Uh, but there was the Abla Canyon. And uh, the Abla Canyon, um, yeah, that, that's another long story, but. Um, what what happened some, there? Well, uh, some of the people that I worked with at Humboldt ended up going to the Abla Canyon. Uh, most of the employees that I worked with, they were thinking like I was thinking in the very beginning. This was a great job, a great livelihood. 
uh, anyone who criticizes the company and causes problems was threatening their livelihood. So I had problems with my coworkers, not all of them, but, but many of them. And um, in order to, to remain in good stead with the company, you had, to, you had to be loyal to what it was the company was doing. And, uh, and, and you, know, they said, you know, radiation is not a, big, not a big deal. You know, you're making a big deal out of nothing. When I go out to my car and, and swipe it with a, a smear pad and find smearable contamination on it, they say, that's not a big deal. But I'm driving that home, and I'm going to the grocery store, and I'm going to other public places, and those people, they don't need to be exposed to that sort of thing. So IBW 1240, when you went to them with the fact that you were discriminated, you were retaliated against, what happened? Well, the, uh, they hired an attorney. It was in a law firm in, in uh, San Francisco. And he didn't have the resources that the PG&E attorneys had. And, uh, and, I, and I, I don't know how much money the IBEW Local 1245 was willing to commit to fight PG&E in trying to deal with Forrest Williams and Bob Rowan. So uh, the, the attorney's name was Morgan, Frank Morgan. And I just felt that he was just not prepared for our arbitration case. Yeah, but I'm going to have to tell you that I think his heart was in the right place because afterwards, after that was all over with, said and done, Frank Morgan started doing some work pro bono for me. And uh, I sued for that police report. And, uh, and it was his arguments that he presented that ultimately prevailed with the court. And I got it because PG&E uh, PG was responsible for what was in that police report. The second page of the police report stated that a copy of it had been sent back to PG&E. And, and, and the, the police department and the city of Eureka, they were claiming privilege. It was a privileged document, so therefore I was not entitled to have access to it. And, um, and so finally I convinced my attorney because by, by this time, I, 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 I had learned some things. And I said, you know, you need to tell that judge. In fact, when we walked in the courtroom the day that this happened, I'd never forget that. I said, you need to tell that judge to have the city give him a copy of that police report. He can take it into the chambers, in camera it's called, and he can read it for himself. And on the second page, and it was right on my simulation of it that I had constructed from memory after having read it several times and then, the, the fellow took it back and burned it up in a waste paper can. It said that a copy went to PG&E. It also said a copy of it went to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And so when, uh, when the judge took that into his chambers and he read it, and then he came back out and immediately ordered the, the city of Eureka to disclose a true copy of it to, to us, and then we filed a lawsuit. pg and &E prevailed in battling against that, though, because statute of limitations. My simulation that I had constructed for my attorney proved that I knew of its existence by the 1st of December, 1970. I think it was a 71. I had to look at my dates. Uh, but we didn't get a copy of the report for about two years, two and a half years. But that was because my attorney said, we're not going to make a, we're not going to file a suit like this until we get a copy of that report. And, uh, and so I know I'm jumping around here a little bit, but regarding that report, uh, when we got a copy of it, my attorney did file a suit. pg e prevailed because the statute of limitations in California on such matters is one year. I see. And, and, uh, and so I, my, it was barred. It, 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 uh, it went up to the appellate courts and the appellate courts agreed it was, it was, uh, it they was, manipulated the legal process. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, I mean, you're not the only one and your, your fellow worker that have been retaliated against for making health and safety complaints at nuclear plants. First of all, do you think this is a systemic problem nationally? And if people retaliated for making health and safety plants, and that's their job, how do we know what's really going on in these plants? You don't. You don't you gotta protect nuclear workers. They're, they're on the inside. They know what goes on there. When they step up and they say, you know, these are the kinds of things, things that are going on and, 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 uh, and bring them to the public's attention, 
uh, they've got to be protected. Uh, I was not protected at all. There was no, there was no protections whatsoever. Because I, 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 I went to the uh, federal grand jury, I went to the United States attorney, I went to the National Labor Relations Board, which was a joke because they said these matters pertain to things that occurred more than six months prior to you filing the charge, so therefore it's barred. Statute of limitations, barred. And so no matter which way I turned, it, it was, uh, there was just nothing that I could do. Now, I, I want to mention one thing that I think is very important here. I became connected with William H. Rogers, law professor at the University of Washington School of Law, and at the time he was doing work with the, the Environmental Defense Fund, suggested that we should, the, well, he suggested to the Environmental Defense Fund that we should petition to uh, secure some rights for atomic workers. And, uh, and they were able to bring on board the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers International Union, whatever that organ, that the union was called. And they... OCAW. Yeah, and they, and they agreed. But guess what? W Local 1245 is not in our best interest. So they would not sign on to it. And all it was was a petition to, to uh, I forget the, the, the legal jargon that describes that process, but it was to provide protections for would nuclear workers. Would you say the IBW is a company union? Yes. I would. What does that mean? Controlled by the company. You know, in bed with the company. They, 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 uh, it's a really strange bedfellow. They just, uh, you know, to me, the, the company dictated terms. They did the company's bidding. <laughs> so <laughs> so the health and safety there. of yourself and other workers, that was secondary to Yes, I believe that. You know, they spend a tremendous amount of money, the company does, and I think the union dovetails with it in terms of creating this facade of uh, safety and uh, for both employees and the public and all that kind of stuff, but it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. And what do you think people in this country should do about it? Because you have all these old plants, we license them, a lot of them are seriously contaminated, there's radiation leaking. And yet the workers who are they want in charge of health and safety, there's no protection for them. I mean, it sounds like a very serious um, systemic problem. If you want my personal opinion, yeah. shut them down. Shut every last one of those nuclear plants down and don't build any more. We have to look for alternative ways to produce energy. Nuclear power is not the way. Because you can't rely, you can't trust the operators of nuclear facilities or the regulators of them to protect the public. You can't. The bottom line is the most important thing. They'll lie, they'll cheat at every twist and turn. And, and, and I know that from hard experience. And nothing's changed. I mean, back in the day, the AEC was criticized for having that dual role of regulating and promoting nuclear power. So that was fixed, right? It was fixed by replacing the AEC with the NRC. But the NRC is more of the same. It's more of the same. And has any pg and &E official ever gone to jail? And do you think there should be criminal penalties for Absolutely. retaliating against? <laughs> Absolutely. Starting with Burt Jones and uh, Lawrence Brown, who happens to be a pg and &E attorney, who lied time and again during my unemployment insurance appeals board hearing. He knew better. He, he's bringing stuff for that referee to try to persuade the referee to a conclusion that was totally false. And, uh, and, and and he should have been disbarred. I found out much later that he was actually a personnel manager for PG&E and then went to law school at night and got his degree and then became a hatchet man at 245 Market Street. Uh, I just, my blood boils every time I think about, about him. But I mean, this is criminal activity. I mean, they're basically oh, lying under oath yeah. and they're just falsifying and... Absolutely. In fact, uh, Savannah Blackwell wrote some stuff for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. She called PG&E a corporate criminal. When I read that, I said, right on. And uh, she, one of the cases that she was talking about was the Neil Aiken case at Diablo Canyon. He, he was concerned about safety at that plant. And as I understand it, the same problems that, with plant management there that I had with plant management at Humboldt Bay. So he got fed up with it took it to a, a board of directors meeting. Wrong thing to do. <laughs> and, uh, but but uh, he, he took it uh, to them and then they said, well, 
we're going to have him mentally evaluated, and they did, and they said he was unfit to, to operate. Or to, he was a control operator or a shift, shift foreman, I guess, a shift foreman. He wasn't uh, on my side of it. I was a, a technical side, you know, radiation control technician, nuclear control technician, but he was uh, uh, on, on the operation side. And uh, well, he lost his job, but then they found uh, uh, wherever they arbitrated that, they found that, uh, he, that PG&E had actually retaliated against him. And, that, and so I'm not sure exactly how all that turned out, but I've got a section in my book about him and, uh, and, uh, and some others too. So, so it sounds you know, like there's no accountability for PG&E. They pretty much- there, there isn't from my point of view. There's gonna be pushback. I know there's gonna be pushback from PG&E on my book, but let them go ahead and do whatever it is. I'm 74 years old and in the twilight years of my life, and I'm gonna to try to do the right thing before I pass on. And what people end up doing with it is up to them. But they've got to wake up and smell the daisies. You know, it's, uh, oh, hey. Uh, it's a terrible thing that people are in. Lives well, are destroyed, I guess people are, are terrified, intimidated, and afraid to tell the truth about what's going on. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, well, Forrest Williams was actually, uh, uh, reinstated. Uh, there's a story behind all of that. And he went back to work for one day and told him, I can't work for a company like that. And, and, uh, and left. Yeah. And, and he was re reinstated. Uh, you know, there's an icon down here in the Bay Area called Sam Cagle back in the day, an uh, arbitrator. And a lot of people thought he was, you know, uh, the best thing since sliced bread or something, but not, I didn't think that at all. Because when I walked into the room where the arbitration hearing, where my arbitration was hearing, it was in a PG&E office with PG&E stuff on all four walls, and Sam Cagle calling the, the PG&E attorney Bud, and, uh, and the PG&E attorney calling Sam Cagle, Mr. Cagle, Sam. And then they made a, 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 a some kind of a snide remark about the nurses uh, up there and there's more to that story, but anyway, Sam Cagle said, don't talk to about nurses like that. I'm gonna to have to be dealing with them in San Francisco with all the nurses in San Francisco. That's, uh, that's in the transcript, so I pulled it out. It's in my book, I quoted him, but I was not impressed with him at all. He, he was not willing to determine or try to, de to establish why pg &E had actually gotten rid of me. He was only concerned with one thing, and that was the phone call that I made. And, and unfortunately, uh, to be quite honest about it, I denied making that call at my arbitration hearing, but I did not deny making it at the Unemployment Insurance Appeal Board. I made that decision, I, I called Friday night and, and told uh, the plan engineer that he had better never treat me like that again. What did he do? Well, uh, when Forrest Williams was fired, I, on the spur of the moment, on a Friday morning, I went to work. I took a soap box that my wife had. It was an empty soap box. I made a collection box out of it, and I took it to work, and I hung it on the bottom of the radiation status board. And, uh, and it created quite a stink. Did I think that it might? Sure, I probably did. Because by this time, I could care less what PG&E management So did. you were taking up a collection for I was taking a, a take, I was taking up a collection for, for a force, and I made the statement on the, I, I wrote it in there uh, that, uh, you know, uh, let's support Forrest Williams for the bold stand he made for all of us. And uh, the plan engineer ended up sticking his finger in my face. And he got it within six inches of my nose. And, and another employee testified to this at my Unemployment Insurance Appeal Board hearing. And he said, and I said, you get your finger out of my face right now. And he stuck it closer, within six inches of my nose and said, this is my finger, I will do with it what I want. And, uh, and I left. I, I just, I can't, I can't handle any more of this place today. I'm, and I left without permission. And that was a big problem. You gotta get permission to leave before you leave. You know, and I just left. I couldn't put up with that place. And that night, still stewing in my juices, I called him and said, don't ever do that to me again. Well, meanwhile, Bud Brown was working on that police report with the police the chief, and there's the chief of police. And there's a lot more to that story. But uh, so that was designed to make me a security risk, totally false information. And, and, uh, and then uh, 
when I showed up Monday morning to work, within a minute or two of the workday, I, I was called to the front office and confronted about the phone call. And, you know, without thinking, you know, I should have said, yeah, I made that phone call, and this is exactly what happened. That's what I should have done. But I, but I said, no, I didn't make that call. And, uh, and so that's what they hung their hat on, you know. And, you know, when I was 20, probably 29 years old then or 28 years old, and uh, and just yeah. fed up with that place like you wouldn't believe and, and everything that, when, that that happened there. And so, well, Don Wagner was an NBC News producer, and he won three Emmy Awards during the latter part of the '60s: Sea of Death, Slow, Slow Guillotine. I don't remember the third, the name of the third, but but then I got a call one day, and from this fellow by the name of Don Wagner, who I did not know, he introduced himself. And uh, he said, I, I want to uh, do a, a documentary on nuclear power. And uh, I've been reading about the troubles that you've been having with PG&E and the Humboldt Bay Power Plant. Would you be willing to talk to me? I said, sure, why not? I've been talking to everybody else. So we met, went up on Humboldt Hill, looked down over the plant, and I had a long conversation with him about that place. And, uh, he, he, and, I, and I described for about the the reactor water sample becoming hotter and hotter and hotter, and, and the same with the off-gas sample from when I said, well, why do you suppose that the radiation levels in that plant climb so, so high? I said, because it was a breakdown of the fuel cladding, that initial loading of the reactor core with that cheap stainless steel fuel cladding over the, they chose that over the zircloid cladding that the Navy had already developed for its nuclear uh, fleet in the late 50s. And so, he, uh, he said, well, okay, and, and I gave him some other ideas about the kinds of things he might want to talk to them about. And then he asked me who I would recommend uh, for, him to, you know, for him to interview. And I said, well, you know, I, I doubt that they'll allow, allow anyone at the local plant uh, uh, to speak on camera with you. They probably bring somebody from 245 Market Street. But if you can get somebody at the local plant, get the plant engineer and get either one of the two radiation protection engineers, either one. And, and so he did go into the plant. And they had a pre-interview conference in the admin conference room. And they walked out of their PG&E management personnel walked out of there believing that Wagner wasn't going to ask that question because it would require too much time for a 60-minute documentary. And, uh, but guess what? Wagner's first real question was, what about this fuel cladding failure that you had? And it sent PG&E in a tenzy. What happened was Wagner finished his work and ran it in this L.A. area and PG&E came down hard on him. And long story short, they put the kibosh to Wagner's uh, documentary. It was only shown that one time. It's never been shown again. And, and they ruined his career. Wagner sued PG&E because PG&E officials were accusing him of doing things that he did not do, which is, uh, rings a familiar note. And, 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 and then what happened to his case is it was dying on the vine and he called me and he said you know Bob I got to do something here uh, my law firm in LA is falling apart on this thing because PG&E has worn them down with all of their vast resources and the lead attorney uh, I think that like the senior partner became a judge in LA and, uh, and I said, well, talk to David Pessinen in San Francisco. And I explained to him um, that Pessinen had represented uh, the Sierra Club at Bodega Bay and at Point Arena very successfully. And he knows what PG&E is like, so he's not afraid to take them on. And Wagner checked around and verified what I said about Wagner, uh, about uh, Pessinen. And, 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 um, took him on as an attorney, and, and, and he won. He won, the, he won uh, an award for punitive damages that was up at, to that point in time the largest in the history of common law, like eight or nine million dollars for punitive damages alone. Of course, the judge overturned it as being excessive. And so it went up on appeal, and a few years later, they finally settled out of court for half a million bucks. Eventually, he 
faded away and ended up with, uh, I think he had died of lung cancer. He, he passed away, destroyed his career, absolutely. Destroyed his career. My Humboldt Diary, a true, a true story of betrayal of the public trust.